Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we missed yesterday. We had a day off. Yesterday was Balaram Rasayatra. This was the day that Balaram danced with his gopis. And that's an interesting topic. We, we touched it a little bit. Uh, who are these gopis? Uh, how are they different from Krishna's gopis? And Balaram's gopis, it is said if you study this topic carefully that when Balaram engages in Rasa Lila, he does that in the mood of service to Krishna. Everything he does is to support Krishna in service. So that's the actual understanding. Interesting, right? Isn't it? So today we're going to continue reading. We were reading from the third canto, 30th chapter, because it describes how a materialistic person leaves their body. But yesterday or uh, the day before yesterday, I heard uh, my wife, my daughter is a disciple of Indra Swami, and she was listening to a class of his, so I was listening. And he said a couple interesting things that I thought I would just throw in here in the beginning as appetizers, uh, rewarding all of you who come early, Hare Krishna. So there were two questions asked to Srila Prabhupada. One was about the devotee was asking about his relationship with Krishna. How was it revealed? When will it be revealed? And so forth. And then also about leaving his body. And Prabhupada gave a similar answer to both questions. He said that the time is right, I will reveal your relationship with Krishna. And that when you die, I will personally take you back to Godhead. Hare Krishna. So that kind of resolves uh, that issue of, I don't want to die, I'm afraid to die, I don't know what's going to happen. And then you might say, what if I'm not ready and Prabhupada doesn't personally take me back to Godhead? But you know, he'll, he might say, well, that devotee that Prabhupada was speaking to, he'll take back to Godhead because that devotee is sincere and did a lot of service. But the overarching idea is that Prabhupada will take care of you. So you don't have to be afraid. So I thought that was beautiful. And if you give your whole life to Krishna, dedicate yourself to Krishna, Prabhupada will be there for you. And your guru and so many people. Then, in that class, he reminded me of the story of Dhruva Maharaj. And if you remember, that there was a Vaikuntha airplane sent for Dhruva. And I want to read the verse that describes what Dhruva did. It, it's quite interesting. And this is, actually, I don't have. Mm, I think it's Srimad Bhagavatam 41230. In fact, let me double check. Just give me a second. I'll go to the database and double check if it's 41230. Maharaj was attempting to get on the track. Yes, it's 4, 12, 30. So if you want to reference that or come in here, if you want to put that up, we're going to read the verse and the purport. And um, this is something um, in my search I had neglected because I was searching speci a specific topic and I have to do more research, searching different names. Translation, for Srimad Bhagavatam 4.12.30, translation, when Dhruva Maharaj was attempting to get on the transcendental plane, 
he saw death personified approach him. Not caring for death, however, he took advantage of the opportunity to put his feet on the head of death, and thus he got up on the airplane, which was as big as a house. And normally, death personified comes, uh, they're coming. There was a song when we were young, coming to take you away. Maybe that was the Beatles or something. Yeah, so we, we have this idea of death personified is coming to take us away. And here, Guru Maharaj, death personified is not taking him away. He's walking on the head, using it, the head of death personified as a stairway to get on the Vaikuntha airplane. That's interesting, don't you think? Yes, I think so. So let's read the purport. To take the passing away of a devotee and the passing away of a non-devotee as one and the same is completely misleading. While ascending the transcendental airplane, Dhruva Maharaj suddenly saw death personified before him, but he was not afraid. Instead of death's giving him trouble, Dhruva Maharaj took advantage of death's presence and put his feet on the head of death. People with a poor fund of knowledge do not know the difference between the death of a devotee and the death of a non-devotee. In this connection, an example can be given. A cat carries its kittens in its mouth, and it also catches a rat in its mouth. Superficially, the catching of the cat and the kitten appear to be one and the same, but actually they are not. When the cat catches the rat in its mouth, it means death for the rat. Whereas when the cat catches the kitten, the kitten enjoys it. When Dhruva Maharaj boarded the airplane, he took advantage of the arrival of death personified, who came to offer him obeisances. Putting his feet on the head of death, he got up on the unique airplane, which is described here to be as big as a house. So death personified came to offer obeisances. That's a beautiful meditation. I mean, if you're a devotee, you're in Krishna consciousness. You're meant to go back to Godhead. There's a story I've told this story before, but it's it's totally relevant in this context, and I don't think all of you have heard this story. But a devotee was very ill in the hospital, and I think he may have been sedated. Maybe there was an operation. I forget the details, but anyway, he had a dream, and there was a kirtan party, and he I forget the details of the dream, but he asked Prabhupada about the dream. And in the dream, as I remember, he said, in my dream, the, the non-chanters, meaning, meaning people in general, became chanters. And then he said, Prabhupada, do the chanters ever become non-chanters? And he said, no, their name, is, their name is already written in the book, back home, back to Godhead. So, something like that. The, their name is writ the chanter's name is written in the book, back home, back to Godhead. So we have, we have many, many statements from Srila Prabhupada, like the one we said earlier that, um, here, I'll actually have it written down. Prabhupada told Dhananjaya, don't worry, because when you die, I will personally come and take you back to Godhead. And we have other statements like that. So we're, we're being encouraged not to worry. And here we get more evidence that for the devotee, death personified comes like the cat carrying the kitten. Come to pay obeisances, all glories to you. And also, Prabhupada has said that Maya, although she interferes with our bhakti or superficially interferes, she's, she's actually Krishna's servant and she, she wants us to go back to Godhead. And she's very happy when we go back to Godhead. It's not like when you become a pure devotee, Maya's thinking, I didn't do my job. No, that, 
that she did everything she could to keep you away from Krishna, and you did everything you could to go to Krishna, and you succeeded, she's very happy. So Maya is happy when you become Krishna conscious, and death personified is happy when you become Krishna conscious, and Prabhupada's happy when you become Krishna conscious, and he's there. So that's encouraging. Prabhupada goes on, we'll read the purport, second paragraph. There are many other similar instances in Bhagavat literature. It is stated that when Kardama Muni created an airplane to carry his wife, Devahuti, all over the universe, the airplane was like a big city, carrying many houses, lakes, and gardens. Modern scientists have manufactured big airplanes but they are packed with passengers who experience all sorts of discomforts while riding in them, I can certify to that. So here we're reading in Bhagavatam, uh, sometimes we read about things we have no experience of and they seem quite unbelievable. Uh, Prabhupada's referring here to this city flying in the sky. So it, it's also, we've never seen death personified and that means we've never seen anyone walk on death personified's head and we've never seen these aerial mansions, but they do exist. Material scientists are not even perfect in manufacturing a material airplane. In order to compare to the plane used by Kardama or the plane sent from Vishnuloka, they must manufacture an airplane equipped like a big city with all the comforts of light, lakes, gardens, parks, etc. Their plane must be able to fly in outer space and hover and visit all other planets. If they invent such a plane, they will not have to make different space stations for fuel to travel into outer space. Such a plane would have an unlimited supply of fuel, or like the plane from Vishnu Loka, would fly without it. Hare Krishna. So that's some side information, just a little icing on the cake of this story. So now, now I would like to go back to where we were reading from. We were reading from the, if you want to bring this up, Kamaniya, or any of you have the database, we were reading, we left off reading from the third canto, chapter 30, and I believe we read five verses. We'll check that. This is Lord Kapila Dave discussing how uh, unfortunate souls leave their body. So the last thing we read, I think we should read this again because this is really amazing. Let's go to Canto 3, text 30, excuse me, Canto 3, chapter 30, text 5. Um, Katie, that we left off um, maybe three days back, but on Monday we were reading from the third canto, we diverted. And you remember, we were reading the story about Indra, you remember that? Yeah, so that was so amazing, I want to read it again, this is text five. The conditioned living entity is satisfied in his own particular species of life, while diluted, excuse me, while diluted by the covering influence of the illusory energy, he feels inclined to cast off his body. He feels little in oh, there he is. sleeping. Start over again, rewind the tape. Time to wake up and concentrate. The conditioned living entity is satisfied in his own particular species of life. While diluted, by the covering of the illusory energy, he feels little inclined to cast off his body, even when in hell, for he takes delight in hellish enjoyment. This is so heavy and so important. And, and Prabhupada often makes this point in different ways, maybe sometimes it's not so obvious, that we're in a hellish situation and we don't realize it's hellish, hellish and we, we actually become satisfied. And that's why we're still in the material world because to some degree we're satisfied here because if we were totally dissatisfied, we would have gone already gone back to Godhead. 
So there's some level of satisfaction. And there's two kinds of satisfied people, people in the mode of ignorance and people transcendental. So in order to keep us in the material world, the modes of nature cover us in a way that we feel satisfied. It's a satisfaction of ignorance is bliss. It's a satisfaction of putting your head in the sand, the ostrich satisfaction. And so by, we, re we read the other day that Maya has two potencies and one is covering. So if you cover the reality so you don't actually see the suffering, and you can feel satisfied. And you might say, well, isn't it good to feel satisfied? Isn't that a spiritual position? Not satisfied in ignorance, satisfied in sattva, or satisfied in transcendence. But if you're satisfied in ignorance, then you remain in the material world. If you're satisfied in sattva, you're satisfied with Krishna, not with Maya. So you want to go back to Krishna. So, so the problem, and we run into this problem when we're preaching, and people say, I'm, I'm satisfied, I'm happy, everything is good. And, and then we're thinking, it's a problem that you're happy. It would, it would be better if something happened in your life that disturbed you, so you would get a little bit shaken up and realize everything in this world isn't that great. But as long as you're thinking you're happy in material life, you're covered, and as long as you're covered, you have no impetus to want to get out of material life. So, so let me read this again. This is, I find this verse in purport, although it seems simple, it kind of embodies the, the essence of what Maya does to the living entities. And we can also relate to how she does this to us, to one degree or another, depending on our level of Krishna consciousness. When you're perfectly Krishna conscious, this doesn't happen. While deluded by the covering, while deluded by the covering influence of the illusory energy, he feels little inclined to cast off his body. In other words, he's satisfied in his body, even if it's the body of a hog. Even when in hell, that's very, very heavy. He goes into a hellish condition and he's got this body and he's so covered that even in hell he's satisfied for he takes delight in hellish enjoyment. So what is hellish enjoyment? And you might think, how can you take delight in hellish enjoyment? Well, enjoyment and passion and ignorance is also hellish enjoyment. Intoxication, people take great pleasure in, in the music that some people take pleasure into is very hellish, Thomasic. And sometimes you hear that music and you wonder, how is it they're finding enjoyment in that music? Or, or we see people eating meat. How is it they're finding enjoyment? Or some people eating bats or snakes. Or, and we think, how, how are they finding enjoyment in that? It, it makes no sense to us. They're finding enjoyment in it. Hellish enjoyment. That's Prabhupada's point. So if you're covered enough, you can find enjoyment in the most perverse things. Um, alcohol. If you've never drank, taken any alcohol, I mean, the first time you take it, you cannot believe that people would drink this. It it's just tastes horrible. It's just, I've only, I think I took it once when I was 16. I didn't like it. And the taste is, you know, they manufacture uh, uh, this taste and it's aged this way. And, you know, but for someone in Satwagoon, it's, it's just horrible tasting. But then you, you develop a taste and you like it, so you're covered, uh, or smoking. You develop a taste, you like it, so hellish enjoyment, and so you think you're happy. So that's the whole problem, that you think you're happy. When you're actually suffering, you think you're happy, and that's how you stay in the material world. And that's one of Maya's, one of the ways Maya's, Maya keeps the conditioned soul here. Because you might think, okay, if the conditioned soul has been in the material world for millions of lifetimes, you would think after millions of lifetimes, they would figure it out. But look around you. Has anybody figured it out? Nobody's figured it out. Even so-called religionists, they haven't figured it out. They're talking about how God is helping them enjoy. So it's very sad. So you can see how Maya's covered everyone. Let's read the purport, because the purport just explains the verse. We had read this. It's the last thing we read, I believe. But uh, It's such a nice purport. We'll read it again. It is, so you can go back up under Kamaniya's name. She's put this verse in purport. It is said 
that once Indra, Indra, the king of heaven, was cursed by his spiritual master, Brihaspati, on account of his misbehavior, and he became a hog on this planet, on earth, came down and became a hog. Okay, get this. This really happened. It's not just a fairy tale. He left Indra Loka, the king of heaven, the, not the king of the United States or Russia, the king of heaven. That's a bigger position. That's a big position. He left the position of the king of heaven. He came down and became a hog. Okay, this actually happened. You got that, right? After many days, when Brahma wanted to recall him to his heavenly kingdom, Indra, in the form of a hog, forgot everything of his royal position in the heavenly kingdom, and he refused to go back. He forgot. He got covered. He, so what's the point Prabhupada's making? That even if you're Indra and then you get into the body of a hog, by the covering of Maya, you will find satisfaction in the life of a hog. And you have your children, your wife, and you know you may not look at it as children and wife, but they it's their family. They see it like you see your wife or husband and family. This is the spell of Maya. Maya cast the spell, you're bewildered. Even Indra forgets his heavenly standard of life and is satisfied with the standard of a hog's life. By the influence of Maya, the conditioned soul becomes so affectionate towards his particular type of body, that if he is offered, quote, give up this body and immediately you will have a king's body, he will not agree. This attachment strongly affects all conditioned living entities. Lord Krishna is personally canvassing, quote, give up everything in this material world. Come to me and I shall give you all protection. But we are not agreeable. We think, quote, we are quite all right. Why should we surrender unto Krishna and go back to his kingdom? Quite, I am quite all right. But your next body could be the body of a pig. I am quite all right. Why are you bothering, bothering? Why are you bothering me? I am quite all right. Don't bother me. Everything is quite all right. <laughs> we think we are quite all right. Why should we? That's a quite all right. That's a quite a British Indian expression, I think. We don't say that in America. How are you doing? We say, not bad, okay. Quite all right, no. Why should we surrender under Krishna and go back to his kingdom? This is called illusion or maya. Everyone is satisfied with his standard of living, however abominable it may be. So here, here we have a really clear picture of what maya does and how maya works. Even though they're suffering, somehow or other she makes us satisfied in a way that We suffer, but we don't really notice it. And we think, I am quite all right. <laughs> How can you be quite all right? Everywhere you're around you, there are problems. Everywhere around you, life is leaving us. Everywhere around you, things are changing. You're getting older. Your body's breaking down. How can you be quite all right? Then, then you're thinking, no, I'm, I'm satisfied I'm spiritual. Uh, not necessarily. You may be completely under the influence of Maya, and that's why you feel that way. Correct? Okay. So we have some questions or comments, and then we'll go, we'll read verse 6. So, Kamini, if you can bring up the next verse. Sakarshini says, What about those who are chanting and making offenses at the same time, especially? Vaishnava Bharat, it seems their names 
are removed from the book with a list of those who are on their way to come. They're just postponed. They're on the list, but they're not going to catch the next bus. As Prabhupada said, if you chant, if you're consciously making, you know, it's, it's one thing to make offense to the holy name unconsciously or kind of helplessly, you know, you're trying, trying to chant, but your mind is wandering, or you're disturbed, or you lost your job, and uh, you're bothered, or you're coughing, and you're worried, maybe I have coronavirus, it's natural, your mind's going to be distracted, so you're trying, that's different. But if you're consciously making offense, like you're offend, you're willfully offending devotees, or you're you're uh, committing any one of the ten aparads, and you're making no amends, just then, yeah, your name's on the list, but you're going to get um, delayed for a few hundred lifetimes before you get validated. Or you're, no, 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 no. Your name's on the waiting list. That's it. And it might take a few hundred lifetimes before you get off the waiting list and actually get on the plane. So yeah. So when, when, when Prabhupada is talking about, I'll take you back to Godhead, and you'll go back to Godhead uh, in this way or that way, he's talking about devotees who are practicing to the best of their ability. They're sincere. They're not offensive and so forth. We understand that there can be exceptions, but we don't count on the exception. We count on the rule. This is how you do it. And so to think, well, I know this is how you do it, but maybe I can make it if I don't do this. Yeah, that is always possible. Krishna can do anything. Prabhupada can do anything. Your Guru Maharaj can do anything, but it generally doesn't happen like that. It happens when you follow the standard process, and that's something you can count on. The other, other maybe you can't really count on. That's just if Krishna wants. But even, even you take Jagai and Madhai, okay, they were very fallen. Mahaprabhu saved them, but they had to follow certain etiquette, certain practice, make promises, and so forth. That's how they were saved. So you might say, yeah, but there's mercy. But Prabhupada said, that's not something you rely on. That just comes when it comes. But you want to act in a way that you know you'll get a specific result. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have a question from Rhea. Is it possible that a demigod lining up for a chance to incarnate on earth to become Krishna conscious my demigod agree to take on some group karma that isn't entirely theirs and burn it off at the same time as their own. Well, what we know, generally, it's not generally the service or position of the demigods. That's more the service position of the Vaishnava. So, you know, the pure Vaishnava will do that, will want to do that, or he becomes guru and he takes the karma of his disciples, or he's Jesus Christ, take the karma, anyone's karma who surrenders. Uh, so that's there for the Vaishnava. Um, generally, not you don't find that so much with demigods. Maybe if you're talking about elevated demigods like Lord Shiva, that may be there, you know, compassion, and, you know, because he's a Vaishnava. But other demigods are, they're a bit mixed in that they're more into enjoying than voluntarily suffering. And because the devotee is not, he's no longer concerned with material. He's willing to take inconvenience on behalf of conditioned souls, behalf of his spiritual master, behalf of Krishna to help the conditioned soul. He's willing to take inconvenience. And if one is too attached to enjoying, even though they're a devotee, but they still want to enjoy, they'll be less inclined or not inclined at all to, to do austerity, what to speak of the austerity of taking somebody's karma. That's like, uh, I don't want to do that. I don't know if I can handle that. You have the example of Vasudev Dutta. He, he told Mahaprabhu, 
if you're willing to send everyone back to Godhead, I'll take the karma for that. That's inconceivable because that means suffering, I mean serious suffering for lifetimes. And he's willing to do that. So that's also a manifestation of compassion. And so com that level of compassion arises in the heart of someone who's completely free of material desire or the desire to enjoy the body. But it's generally not the position of demigods. They like to enjoy. They like Krishna and they like to enjoy. It's, you know, I mean, I've, you've probably seen devotees like that as well. Yeah. Right? They like Krishna and they like material enjoyment. So we're trying to get to the point of we like Krishna and we want to enjoy only in relation to Krishna. Okay, so now let's go to text 6, Kamini. It's 336. If you can put that up. This chapter isn't... Yeah, there it is. If you go down to Kamaniya, you will see the verse. This chapter is entitled Description by Lord Kapila of Adverse, Adverse Fruit of Activity. Let me chant the Sanskrit just because it's purifying. Atma Jaya Sutta Gara Pashudravina Bandushu Nirudha Mula Ridhaya Atmanam Bahumanyate such satisfaction with one's standard of living is due to deep-rooted attraction for body, wife, home, children, animals, wealth, and friends. In such association, the conditioned soul thinks himself quite perfect. So, in the second canto, the it, it talks about how we have to face death and what we do to deal with it. And it says that we surround ourselves by family members, but the family members are described as infallible soldiers because nobody can save us from dying. So, you know, we can make all arrangements, but, but nobody ultimately can save us, neither the doctor or the husband, the wife, the son, the daughter, or other relatives. So they're, they're, it's said in that part of the Bhagavatam that a person surrounds himself by this family as if it's going to be a fortress of protection. But, you know, taxes still come. And what do they say? Two things are sure, death and taxes. So, yeah. So taxes come and coronavirus comes and so many things come and there's nothing we can do about it. And ultimately we get old and one day we have to leave our body. So that's the idea. Mm. But here it says, in such association, the conditioned soul thinks himself quite perfect. In other words, he thinks, I'm protected. And he also thinks everything is great. And I'm, I'm just like, it's heaven on earth. And that's, that's the illusion. Heaven on earth. And then one day your heaven explodes. So... A devotee is not trying to create heaven on earth. He's trying to, you, you could say a devotee is trying to create heaven within his consciousness, but he's not trying to create heaven externally because he knows that's impossible. Purport. The so-called perfection of human life is a concoction. Therefore, it is said that the materialist, however materially qualified he may be, is worthless because he is hovering on the mental plane, which will drag him again to the material existence of temporary life. In other words, that's a verse Prahlad Maharaj quotes. And he's saying, whatever good you see in people, it's misused. And the so-called good being misused is just going to cause them to eventually take birth again in the material world. So even though it's good, it's not good because the good is misused. But what is Prabhupada? Yeah, however qualified he may be, is worthless because he's on the mental plane. What does the mental plane mean? 
Mm -hmm. Prabhupada described mental plane, the nature of the mind is, what does the mind do? It thinks, what do I want? What don't I want? So the mind is absorbed in thinking about what I like, what I don't like. Not absorbed in thinking about what is Krishna like? What is my guru like? What is Krishna not like? What is my guru not like? It's just absorbed in thinking what I like. So, yeah, so I have good qualities. I employ the good qualities in improving myself materially so I can get what I want and I can avoid what I don't want and I don't incorporate that 